Yuan rulers like Kublai Khan sought to preserve some continuity in their rule to use existing Chinese government um, systems and officials. But eventually, but eventually that sort of broke down with the Mongols being focused on controlling the military. The Chinese were still uh, presiding over civil office, but this led to a lot of conflict. The Mongol rulers didn't speak Chinese and the Mongol rulers wind up breaking down what had been a backbone of the Chinese system which was the civil service exams. Now, civil service exams, what's so important about that? It's a huge deal in the history of China. Any large imperial system relies on government officials. The emperor cannot oversee everything all by himself. China's stable, very effective system relied on an army of government officials who were known as scholar officials. You can see them here um, in their robes, holding their scrolls, sign of their literate understand, their literacy and, and their ability to communicate effectively, and they are behind the emperor. They are literally backing him up. So they're entrusted with running parts of the government. And that trust was based on a system that evolved in the Tang Dynasty of testing potential scholar officials on their knowledge and character. So an exam system was in place. If you wanted to, to have a position in government, you potentially could do that as long as you were a man, not a woman, you, because there was a system of education that allowed you to learn literacy and then learn the Confucian cl classics and to actually develop sufficient knowledge that you could take a test. This system was a meritocracy. It was rejecting the idea that the government should be run only by the aristocrats, by the people who have inherited title and wealth. Instead, the idea is people of skill, hence um, of merit. Those who have abilities will be found through this system of examination. And so this is a wonderful Song Dynasty painting that shows these people have written their, their elaborate essays on the Confucian classics. That was the system. They were not tested on a particular branch of practical knowledge. They were tested on all of the great Confucius writings. The idea being that it's like a liberal arts education, that you are your mind is developed through these source texts, these great, these great texts that have lived and been the rock of the culture, and that they, that your ability to draw from them shows your ability to think, to think critically and to think ethically. Ethically, so this system had grown with a fair amount of complexity. Theoretically, you know, a farmer's son could rise up in the ranks. In general, it is certainly true that the wealthy did better in this system. They had the means to hire tutors in order to go through the rigorous long schooling that was necessary. You had to be able to be supported. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't as if it was a purely equitable system. But it was a system that worked pretty well, and it was also a very hard system. Here is a painting from the Ming Dynasty of all of these people. All of these men have taken the examinations. They want to become part of the civil service, and they're wait, they're, they've come to, to line up to see if they have made it. 99% of people did not. <laughs> So, I mean, the odds are tough. You've got to be really smart. This process was rigorous. Here's a photograph of the exam, the little huts or cottages that were used for the taking of the exam because you would go into one of these huts or cottages with some food, with some clothes, with a chamber pot, and you would sit there for three to five days and you would answer essay questions. <laughs> so. Keep this in mind anytime you have to do an exam that seems hellacious, at least you're not in there with your chamber pot.
these exams were a mark of accomplishment. They were an, a ticket into the civil service to getting a government positions, and they were also a mark of status. So here is a scholar official, and he has passed the highest exams in first place, and the two cranes indicate that status. So this wasn't just getting a good gig in the government. This was also a whole identity that one earned as a learned person, a refined person. So by the time the Yuan dynasty eliminates the civil service, they are, by that point, eliminating a whole system of status and respect that people had invested their lives in. And in fact, the Yuan dynasty comes to discriminate against the scholar class, the scholar officials. The elite Chinese scholars were said to be the lowest of the low. That it would, they were said to be lower than prostitutes. So there was actually a ranking system that the Yuan rulers imposed that put Mongolians on the top. They had, they had a kind of um, quota system for who could be in government. And it was a great deal of it was by racial hierarchy. So if you were Mongolian, you had first choice. If you were from some of the Mongolian Islamic territories and you were serving them, then you were second choice. And the very bottom were these scholars who had passed these exams and demonstrated their ability. So what happens is you have this whole class of Chinese elites who had prepared themselves for a lifetime of imperial service, and they are rejected in their own country. They become outsiders or outcasts, as they call themselves. And for these people, painting becomes a form of self-expression, a way of a way of coming to grips with what it is to live in a country that's no longer yours, and of continuing but changing their training as humanists, as Confucianists, as people who are adept at the arts of the brush, the at calligraphy, at poetry, at painting, at these kind of higher forms, refined forms of human expression. And what we see then is a school of painting, a, a kind of painting that is known as literati painting and is an ideal of painting as a refusal of the world, those in a refusal in a way of selling yourself out to the Yuan dynasty, a refusal of everything that is slick and commercialized. So this is a kind of painting called literati because, literati, because it deals with literary themes. It often has poetry written right into it. And it is painted for friends and fellow literati. It is one of the most important points about it is this is not painting for sale even though some of these literati will actually sell their paintings. <laughs> That's another story. But it is conspicuously refusing to please an audience who would buy a painting because it's gorgeous or because it's, um, it, it, it's enchanting. And so these, these paintings are very plain. They are very not slick. They're not pretty. They have a raw quality. They're just really bare bones, ink and paper, not silk. And here, Nizan is the great case, case study because it was said of him that he was as economical of ink as if it was gold. This is the celebrated literati dry brush technique. And the, the brushwork is dry, not necessarily to be stingy with your ink, but to be, to be very pared down, very bare bones, stripped of all sumptuousness, the way that these people had been stripped of their positions at court. So Nizan has this wonderful statement that explains what painting is for him as a literati. What I call painting does not exceed the joy of careless sketching with a brush. I'm not painting so someone buys this or admires it or says it's good. I'm painting because I'm enjoying it. It's careless. I'm just sketching. 
I do not seek a formal likeness, but do it simply for my own amusement. Again, he, he emphasizes the note of my autonomous pleasure here. And he's saying that that's about my sketching. I don't care if this looks like a tree or a rock to you. I'm doing it for amusement. Recently, I was rambling about and came to a town. The people asked for my pictures, but wanted them exactly according to their own desires and to represent a specific occasion. And he says, I don't do that. And then they are insulting, scolding, cursing. What a shame. But how can one scold a eunuch for not growing a beard? A eunuch, a castrated man, will see them in the Forbidden City, or will hear about them more than see them. You know, a eunuch doesn't have uh, the the test the testicle ability <laughs> to grow a beard because the androgenizing hormones are gone. And he's saying, I don't even have the ability to please people with my painting because I'm such an outsider that this is something I do in nature as I ramble around, as I find a kind of outsider freedom. So Wu Zhen's painting also has that kind of spare quality of just the dry brush, really bare bones. And his subject matter here, bamboo and rock, like bamboo, the metaphor for having flexibility, you can bend without breaking, and rock, the sense of stability and integrity. So the idea of an amateur ideal, I'm pointing out here by comparing to Vincent van Gogh, who also really didn't sell any paintings or make it during his lifetime. Because we often think in our culture of amateur as an insult, right? So, you know, oh, you're an amateur, you don't know how to do that. Leave it to the professionals. But actually the word amateur comes from amore. It comes from love. It's doing something for the love of it. So you can actually flip that hierarchy of values and say these painters, the, these paintings are far more authentic than something done commercially because they are they come out of deep feeling and deep personal meaning. So there's also this sense of an artist inventing a very powerful, moving language of art out of suffering, out of difficulty, and that language of art is purposely not pretty. And so it reminds me of the astonishing music of Billie Holiday. If you don't know her music, you should listen to it, or Robert Johnson from the 30s. Now, you know, Nizan was in no way oppressed the way they were oppressed, right? Being an African-American in America in the early 20th century, uh, you know, with this strict, harsh racial apartheid system. The reason I'm pointing it out, though, is that the music has a kind of raw, a raw magic that is a combination of pain and beauty together, and that has a tremendous integrity and authenticity and we sent, we understand as we hear that, that particular beauty and pain, that the art is involved with political resistance. It's a refusal to be broken down by this unjust system. It is a bearing up under it and finding your own way to articulate beauty even through the pain. And really that's what Nizan is also doing as he paints the mountains and the trees with his dry brush alone on his rambles. <laughs>